Have you ever wondered why you might feel comfortable when listening to certain musical intervals, while feeling very unpleasant when listening to different chords? This is, in fact, explained by the frequency ratios of musical notes involved. To start with, we have to learn about sound from a physics point of view. Sound results from the continuous vibrations of air particles, which in turn vibrate our eardrums. Our brains then interpret these wave-like vibrations as sounds. The number of vibrations per second is called frequency, which is measured in hertz, and the frequency of a sound determines its pitch. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. For example, when plucked, a violin string vibrates 196 times per second, so the frequency of the sound produced is 196 hertz. If the frequency of the sound produced by another string is 440 hertz, then the pitch of the string is higher. Now, having learned the basic physics concept, we can move on to the musical aspect of our investigation. Musical notes are sounds of certain frequencies. Playing an ascending order of frequency will produce a musical scale. Combinations of two of these sounds are called intervals. We shall now use a piano keyboard to further illustrate this. This is a C major scale. C is the first note in this scale, so we denote it as Do. Putting the scale notes in ascending order, we sing them Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, Ti, Do. Playing Do and Re together is described as a major second interval because Re is the second note in the scale. Next is a major third interval because Mi is the third note in the scale. This is a perfect fourth interval. However, the word perfect is not because this interval sounds better. It is related to other musical concepts which will not be discussed here. Similarly, this is a perfect fifth interval. Finally, do and do played together is called an octave. It is obvious that the two notes forming an interval have their own distinctive frequencies. We can represent the relationship of these two notes with a ratio. It is this ratio that determines how pleasant or unpleasant the interval sounds. Therefore, we shall now do some investigations on the ratios of the frequencies of the two notes forming an interval. Of course, we can find out these ratios using the frequencies detected by professional equipment. In fact, there is an idea called twelve equal temperament, which states that the range of frequency within an octave is divided into twelve equal steps, in which there are equal frequency ratios between successive steps. Let's take the musical note C as an example. According to twelve equal temperament, the ratios are represented by twelve different powers of two. Which together multiply to get to the ratio that shows their frequency relationship between two notes an octave apart. Moving on, let's discuss a factor that affects sound quality: beatings. Beatings are some unfavorable messy sounds that we may hear when more than one note are played together. They are easily heard when we play certain musical notes together. Let's learn more by looking at the sound wave graphs of musical intervals, which are plotted according to the ratios derived from twelve equal temperament. More about graph plotting will be discussed later in this video. As we can see, the graphs are all very smooth in shape, which indicate that there are no beatings. However, It is undeniable that some intervals sound unpleasant to our ears. So you may wonder, why are there no beatings in any of the graphs? In fact, it is very hard for us to tune a musical instrument very accurately according to twelve equal temperament. This results in frequencies that form ratios which are not as ideal as those suggested by twelve equal temperament. The resulting frequency ratios are then approximate. And beatings will likely be heard. Musicians in the past who found it hard to tune instruments accurately had developed a number of different systems to explain the frequency relationship between notes within an octave. In fact, there are a lot of interesting mathematics in those tuning systems based on approximate frequency ratios. For example, Pythagorean tuning, 
which rose in the 16th century, suggested that musical notes can be tuned based on two important ratios. That is, all perfect fifth intervals are made of notes having a ratio of frequencies of two to three, and the ratio for octaves is one to two. With this in mind, we can actually derive the frequency ratios of all intervals. Here is how we do it. We know that C and G form a perfect fifth interval, so the ratio is two to three. We also know that in a G major scale, G is the first note and D prime is the fifth note, so the frequency ratio between these two notes is two to three. To find the frequency ratio of C to D prime, we can multiply the two found ratios and then derive that the ratio of C to D prime equals to four to nine. As mentioned earlier. The frequency ratio of octave notes is one to two, so we can therefore conclude that the ratio of C to D is A to nine. Similarly, D to A is also a perfect fifth interval with a frequency ratio of two to three. Since the frequency ratio of C to D is eight to nine, we can calculate that the frequency ratio of C to A is sixteen to twenty-seven. A to E prime is another perfect fifth interval with a frequency ratio of two to three. Again, since C to A is found to be sixteen to twenty-seven, we can get the ratio of C to E prime, which is equal to thirty-two to eighty-one. Since the ratio of the notes forming an octave is one to two, we know that C to E is double the ratio of C to E prime, that is sixty-four to eighty-one. E to B is another perfect fifth interval with a frequency ratio of two to three, making use of the frequency ratio C to E equals to sixty-four to eighty-one. We can deduce that the ratio of C to B is one hundred and twenty-eight to two hundred and forty-three. Lastly, as a perfect fifth interval, B to F prime has a frequency ratio of two to three. If we combine this into the ratio of C to B, one hundred and twenty-eight to two hundred and forty-three, we realize that the ratio of C to F prime equals two hundred and fifty-six to seven hundred and twenty-nine. Just as in the previous calculations, since the ratio of C to F prime is one to two. We can derive that the ratio of C to F equals 512 to 729. To summarize, here are the frequency ratio of notes forming intervals. After studying frequency ratios calculations of different intervals, you might wonder how ratios are related to how they sound. How do we determine whether intervals are pleasant or not to hear? Actually, to answer this question, the combined sound waves produced by an interval must be studied. We interpret notes because we sense the sound wave produced. We can represent these sound wave patterns using displacement time graphs, where the y-axis denotes the displacement of the waves, that is, the distance the particle moves during vibration, whereas the x-axis denotes the time in seconds. A typical displacement time graph looks like this. This time interval is called a period, in which a particle completes one vibration. The reciprocal of period is frequency in hertz, which means number of vibrations per second. This is the function representing these types of graph. To grasp the idea of this sine graph, we shall consider the following example. When we put f equals to two, we obtain this graph. This period of time is 0.5 second. So therefore, the frequency of this wave is one over 0.5 second, which is equal to two hertz. Let's now look at some true cases. The frequency of a G note produced by the fourth string of a violin is 196 hertz. By inputting f equals to 196, we can obtain this graph. The frequency of an A note produced by the second string of a violin is 440 hertz. By inputting f equals to 440, we can obtain this graph. When comparing the two, what do you notice? When an interval is played, sound waves interfere with each other, forming a new waveform. This is similar to water waves. Water levels change more significantly when two waves meet rather than when there's only one wave. The new waveform has a distinct shape and frequency, so this is why we interpret an interval so differently from interpreting the two originally separated notes. 
In order to investigate whether an interval sound is harmonic or not, we must study the displacement time graph of the combined sound waves formed by two interval notes. To begin, we must return to physics again. If we want to obtain a displacement time graph of a resultant wave, we simply add up the two interfering waves. As a result, the displacement time graphs of the interfered sound waves are represented by this function. To grasp the basic idea of the sound interference of the two notes in a musical interval, let us first input f equals to 2 into the previous function representing a single sound wave. Also, input f equals to 3 into that function. With a frequency ratio of 2 to 3, these two sounds form a perfect fifth interval. Here are the displacement time graphs of the two sounds. When we overlap the two waveforms and add up the displacements point by point, like this, we'll be able to obtain the interference waveform. These curves, known as crests and troughs, are heard by us as beatings, which give a sense of harmonic or inharmonic notes. The more an interval beats, the more inharmonic it sounds. Unlike the function for single sound waves, when we investigate musical intervals using this interference function, we simply need to input the numbers in the frequency ratios for F1 and F2 because we are focusing on the shape of the graphs but not the accurate values in the graphs. As the ratio of two Fs is proportional in any notes of the same intervals, the shapes they show are the same, even though the exact frequency values are different. Now, we come to the most important question in this video. How are the frequency ratios of musical notes related to whether they sound harmonic or not? It is not difficult to answer this question. We simply need to input the ratio values calculated previously using Pythagorean tuning into the function representing musical intervals. First, input f1 equals to 8 and f2 equals to 9 in order to obtain the interference waveform of a major second interval. Similarly, using the found ratios, the interference waveform of all musical intervals can be obtained, and by looking at the number of crests and troughs in the interference graphs, we can compare the intervals with one another, thus gaining an idea of how pleasant the intervals sound. Whether an interval sounds pleasant or not depends not only on the sound waves themselves, but also on our brain's interpretations, which may vary in different people. We can only compare the graphs with obvious difference. For example, when we compare a perfect fourth with a major seventh, it is obvious that a major seventh sounds more unpleasant because of the high beat frequency. Let's consider another case. When comparing a major second with a perfect fifth, we notice that the line in the graph representing a perfect fifth interval is much smoother, while the beat frequency in a major second interval is rather high. Therefore, we can conclude that a perfect fifth interval sounds more pleasant than a major second interval. We might also compare the graphs of a major sixth interval with an octave. Since an octave graph is smoother and the beat frequency much lower than that of a major sixth interval, an octave sounds more pleasant than a major sixth interval. Coming to an end, we now know that for musical intervals to sound pleasant depends on the frequency ratios and interferences of two musical notes. By calculating the frequency ratios of intervals, we can obtain interference graphs which in turn show us intervals wave patterns and tell us whether or not they sound pleasant. Indeed, it is amazing how such simple logic accounts for the musical intervals we encounter on a daily basis. By studying musical intervals, we learn about the fascinating connection between mathematics and physics. If we spend even more time studying such concepts, we are bound to discover the beauty of mathematics and understand fully how mathematics is the answer to every little thing around us. Last but not least, we would like to give a big thanks to our teacher advisor, Mr. W.K. Chang, who advised us throughout the past months and assisted us in discovering the beauty of mathematics and numbers.